teeming with desire. Wrapped in rows of bright beads and sumptuous silks, Ariadne, the overlooked princess, dances on the steps of her father's palace. Round and round and round she spins, with her hair gleaming like the sap of the cypress tree. Round and round on the palace steps, Ariadne spins and she weaves. It's a personal ritual. She dances to commune with the ocean. She dances to welcome the waves. Every day Ariadne dances and every day the waves respond. Round and round and round on the steps, Ariadne spins and she weaves. Dawn. And shouts are passed up from the shore, from voice to ear, from voice to ear, until the word reaches King Minos that they have arrived. The Athenian sacrifice has landed. Seven years have passed already. Ariadne remembers it well. She remembers the ceremony and the smoke, the singing and then the silence. Her questions hanging in the air and then fizzling out of existence. Her mother's rage and then absence. Her father's tears in the darkness. And now they come again, in memory of her brother, and in memory of Androgeus, the only name which seems to matter now, more valuable beyond the veil than he ever was within it. And Ariadne never knew this brother, but she feels as if she could see his face as clearly as the gods and the beasts which reach out, orange and gold, from the palace walls. Seven years and it begins again. Fourteen young Athenians sent to face the creature which lives within Daedalus's maze, to quench the vengeful fire which is the only light that King Minos knows now. Seven young maidens, seven young warriors, sent to face the creature within the maze, which lives behind the most inviting walls that you ever saw. Walls which Ariadne must not approach. Walls from which no gods reach out smiling. Silent walls, tall walls, walls which contain he whom her mother Pasiphae will not name, for the creature within is her mother's son, but is not of her father. Another question which fizzles away. And the soldiers will not speak the creature's name, but the children call him the beast, and they say that he skewers his victims on a pair of twisted horns, that he watches them die a long, agonising death, and that the beast, their dying screams, are like a lullaby. But to Ariadne, her brother is a shadow, and she dances in his shadow even as she sings in the sunlight. As the ceremony commences, Ariadne joins her mother and her sister on the palace steps to watch the prisoners, the sacrifice, parading past her father, they're showing off their value. And the young maidens come first, and they're quiet, their eyes are averted towards the ground. But one of the girls, one of the girls holds her head up high, one of the girls looks at Ariadne with blazing eyes. <coughs> it doesn't make any difference, Ariadne thinks. You can't resist tradition, can you? But she looks away from that girl. Can't keep the link going. Can't face the mirror. Ariadne looks away until the young warriors approach. And Ariadne looks at them and she thinks that they look like the soldiers of the palace, but their armour is missing. And the first soldier, he's holding his head up high. The warrior is holding his head up high. And he's looking at Ariadne. He's smiling at Ariadne. And in Ariadne's chest, her heart begins to beat a maddening rhythm. She looks away from the soldier and poppies begin to bloom in her cheeks. She glances up again, however, when the warrior speaks his name to her father. Theseus, he says, but he's not looking at her father. He's still looking at Ariadne. He's still smiling at Ariadne. Theseus winks at Ariadne before he's pushed on his way and Ariadne watches the young warrior until he disappears from sight. King Minos announces the start of the feast in memory of Androgeus, but Ariadne is not tempted by the succulent meats nor the bursting fruits. Instead, she takes on the guise of a servant, offering bowls of fruit to her family and her father's guests. She goes to Daedalus, the master craftsman, where he's seated at the end of a table, and she gives him a bowl of peaches, which she sets down before him. She stands beside the old man, and she says, Daedalus, and she's reverted to a little girl's voice, recalling when she'd sit on a log by his forge, swinging her legs. 
Dedalus, what rough hands you have, she says. And the old man smiles. He remembers their game. Ah, all the better for playing with fire, he responds. Dedalus, what bright eyes you have, Ariadne says. Ah, all the better for plucking the flames from the ashes, he responds. Dedalus, what would you do to escape from the maze? Ariadne asks, and Dedalus does not respond this time. Instead, he picks up a peach from the bowl in front of him. He bites into the succulent fruit so that the juices run down his beard like nectar down the chin of a bee. The warrior, he asks, and Ariadne cannot respond. She looks down towards the floor, but the poppies are back in her cheeks. Dedalus, he takes a bite of the peach again, and he looks over at the girl's parents, locked in their stony silence. And he looks back at Ariadne, the overlooked princess, and he makes a decision. He tells her, give him some thread. Give him a long skein of thread so that he can find his way back out of the maze. Give him a weapon so that he can kill the creature which lives within the maze. And give him these directions. Tell him to go forward, tell him to go down, but never to the left, never to the right. Do you understand? Thread and a weapon, forward and down, but not left and not right. Ariadne's lips begin to work around the directions like an incantation, and she reaches forward to take the bowl of peaches from the table, kissing the old man gratefully as she does so. Later, that evening, as the soldiers are sleeping off the effects of the feast, Ariadne goes to Theseus, where he waits with the other young warriors. She talks to him through the window. She passes through the skein of thread and the weapon, and both are damp with the sweat from her hands. And she passes through the words. She tells him to go forwards and down, but never left and never right. And Theseus, he's smiling at her all the time. He's smiling and he's telling her that when he escapes from the maze, and he will escape from the maze, he will take her away from Knossos, away from Crete, back to Athens, and they will marry. Everything at her disposal. Blade, fibre, body, gifted, accepted, embraced. Dawn, the next day. Fourteen young Athenians are led into the creature's maze. Some children hang around the entrance for a while, terrifying each other with a running commentary which is based on nothing, for no sound escapes from the maze. No sound and no thing. The sacrifice is made, and the king and the queen return to their miseries. After dancing to welcome the waves, Ariadne joins her little sister Phaedra on the palace steps. They're playing a game of squares, which Ariadne loses often. She's distracted by those silent walls. And the sun rises high up in the sky, but soon it grows bored, makes its way back down towards its bed in the ocean. And still the girls are playing their game, unheeded, unnoticed, until a young warrior creeps out from behind those silent walls. Theseus escapes with his fellow Athenians a quiet chain of rebellion. And the bloody-handed youth grabs the hands of Phaedra and Ariadne, and they dash down to the sand, down to the little boat, and they set sail away from Knossos, away from Crete, out onto the ocean, towards Athens. But soon... The warriors need to rest, and so the little boat, it sets down on the island of Naxos, dwelling place of the god Dionysus, god of the harvest, god of the wine, god of ecstasy. And there the jubilant troop disembarks, and they make camp on the shore, and they are elated at life which continues beyond expectation, and they sing and they dance, and Ariadne spins and she laughs ecstatic until the stars lull the merry band to sleep. And then Ariadne dreams. She dreams that she can hear the wind singing. She dreams that she sees the trees dancing. Dreams that she's dancing with the trees. She dreams that she understands their language, that she can feel their words in her feet and in her hands. And then Ariadne wakes. And when she wakes, she finds herself on a windswept shore, beside a dying fire, and utterly alone. 
Ariadne turns on the sand. She calls out to Theseus, calls out to Phaedra, but her eyes are telling her the truth, even as her ears will not, for that little boat is still there on the horizon, sailing away from Naxos without her. Ariadne begins to spin on the sand, round and round and round. She's performing her ritual, communing with the ocean, begging the waves to turn that little boat around to return Theseus to her. Round and round and round Ariadne spins, but the waves are distracted and the ship disappears. Still Ariadne spins, round and round and round on the sand, faster and faster, and she's frenzied now. And as she spins, she screams, and her hair is streaming about her head, and her arms are flailing out at her side. Round and round and round Ariadne spins, and she screams, until her hand reaches out and grabs her shoulder and stops her body, and stops her screaming, and Ariadne falls to the sand, exhausted. Dionysus, god of the harvest, god of the wine, god of ecstasy, takes Ariadne's face in his hands and he steadies her. He holds a cup of sweet amber wine up to her lips and he smiles at the princess who would dance with the ocean. He smiles and he sparkles until Ariadne's heart becomes calm and her eyes become dry. Ariadne abandoned to the elements, to the salt and the sand, to he who runs among the trees. A rebound marriage and stars in her hair, she shines, and she shines, and she shines, and she shines.